Hello everybody, welcome to Snyder's Inc. Today, we got an unpopular notes video, and this is the most disturbing moments in TV history. And we're gonna get right into it, ladies and gentlemen. Hit the like button, subscribe, and comment. Think down below. Let's go. Look at these things. Ah, oh, oh, keep my. your hands in the oh, water. Oh, my God. That's all over. Here. What is happening? Come on. It's everywhere. Clean up. There. Oh. Oh. Uh, when you first see it, it's just overwhelming. The gruesome deaths were recorded on numerous cameras. From the skies over Phoenix, Chopper 15 followed the low-speed police chase. It was when it appeared to come to a stop that the mid-air collision played out before viewers. Helicopters collide while on air. Phoenix, 2007. It's hard to imagine. Oh, uh, we've seen this one. We know this one. This is the one where there was a, a, a chase going on. Two helicopters were trying to catch the chase in the end result, and they weren't paying the fuck attention because they were so focused on getting the action. They collided right into each other, and everyone died in freaking in it. Fucking heartbreak situation that was. God damn. Imagine what happens when a live taping goes wrong. People on the scene seem to have things mostly under control. What happens when they're not? In 2007, a moment just like that came on TV, happening suddenly and without warning that even the news crew on the ground couldn't react. From the skies over Phoenix, Chopper 15 followed the low-speed police chase. It was when it appeared to come to a stop that the mid-air collision played out before viewers. Okay. Okay. All right, they're closing in. Looks like they've... Oh, we're we're going to pull out. We don't, we, don't, uh, we don't know what has just happened right there. Two pilots and newscasters, along with their... That's the thing is, no one really, you could no one knew what happened. It seemed everyone couldn't figure out the two helicopters as they fucking crashed between two different news stations. Crew suddenly collided in midair. Unfortunately, they had been coordinating for safety purposes, but the nature of their work meant it wasn't a simple shot. They had to remain dynamic, chasing the suspect to maintain a steady view for their cameraman. Turn back around and get away from this. We do have two helicopters down during this crash. We're not sure which helicopters they were. If it was a house fire or a robbery, perhaps things should have been different. Suddenly, the two pilots crashed into one another, sending both crafts down at once into the ground below. Even 16 years later, the footage shocks many, leaving people questioning how this could have happened. Oh my god. Uh, it's Chow 3. That's... Uh. Jack Ruby shoots Lee Harvey Oswald on camera. Old footage can sometimes feel like a whole other world. It's 1963. We're originating our program in Washington, where funeral and burial services for John Fitzgerald Kennedy take place today. After the 1963 assassination of America... Oh! I was trying to figure, I was like, who the hell is Lee Harvey? I was like, oh, he's the fuck... Guy, you should... Okay, that makes more sense. Name didn't ring a bell off the top of my head. Fuck, it should for some reason did it. Now, now it does. American President John F. Kennedy, which had been a massive event that many people saw, most people thought that that's as bad as it could get. But briefly after, Jack Ruby proved them all wrong. The then nightclub owner had been long since involved in criminal activity linked to organized crime and had ties to illegal gambling, narcotics, and prostitution. All of this, and it was the shooting of Oswald that took him out. He's been shot. He's been shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. There's the man with a gun. It's absolute panic. Absolute panic here in the basement of the Dallas Police Headquarters. The detectives have their guns drawn. Oswald has been... I mean, obviously they have their guns drawn. One man just walked up and shot another. Of course they're gonna fucking have their guns drawn. Shot. There is no question about it. Oswald has been shot. Ruby didn't miss. The bullet entered in the left side, damaging his stomach, spleen, vena cava, aorta, kidney, liver and diaphragm all before stopping what the hell how much gun what did this gut what was this gun bullet this bullet went through every single part of his body he went up and down and everywhere around his body just to make sure it got every part on the right side he claims to have been distraught by the killing of president kennedy and wanted to save mrs kennedy from having to come back to dallas for the trial it was deemed a spur of the moment decision and that ruby acted of his own accord not everyone agrees, but the insanity plea of Ruby's defense eventually did save him from the death penalty. It's just crazy that both were so clearly documented. Kennedy, and then his assassinator's killing. Retired veteran steals tank and goes on rampage. What? 1995. 
There's a good reason why military-grade equipment is not meant for average people. These are the kinds of things that can cause immense damage in the wrong hands, and even in My man's going on a rampage with a fucking tank! You shouldn't be able to just steal a tank. That should not be something you're able to just do. In the right hands, things can get a bit messy. When Sean Timothy Nelson stole a military tank in 1995, no one could have known just how bad things could have gotten, and yet they just seemed to get worse. The tank chase, as it's been called, uh, that's probably one of the, if not the most dramatic events that have ever occurred that involved the San Diego Police Department. San Diego, California tank chase is likely one of the most dramatic and dangerous events that's happened with the SDPD. Local man Sean Nelson was an army veteran who had suffered greatly in life. Financially, professionally, and interpersonally, he wasn't doing well, largely due to his substance abuse. He was able to steal a 57.3-ton tank from the local California Army National Guard Armory and drive it around for six miles before being caught by police. He crushed cars, utilities, and infrastructure as it came into his warpath, before ultimately crashing live on TV. I'm gonna be honest, how the fuck did he end up crashing on TV? That's unbelievable. How the fuck did he end up crashing the thing? He just high centered it on the center divide. He's stuck. There's no way he's getting off that. Be careful if he gets close there. The SDPD forced it open and used lethal force to end the rampage. If he'd gotten much further, how much more damage could he have done? While Nelson's life ended after this infamous event, it wasn't before truly making an impact on everyone watching. It just goes to show, everyone struggles in life, no matter how put together they might seem. But some make the average struggles seem not so bad. North Hollywood Bank Robber Shootout with LAPD, 1997 our next event took place not too far from the last. In North Hollywood, a shootout that would change lives. Southern California was glued to the television set as we watched the infamous North Hollywood bank shootout play out on live TV. As a day that went down as one of the most violent in Los Angeles history, the North Hollywood shootout was also known as the Battle of North Hollywood. The confrontation between two heavily armed and armored bank robbers and the LAPD would mark history and would be recorded and aired on television. This wasn't the robbers' first rodeo. Larry Phillips Jr. and Emil Manasariano had hit. They look like they do that. They look like they'd be robbing a bank. I don't know. They look like they have the most ultimate shootout in the history of freaking ever. But they look like they'd be doing some robbing some goddamn banks. Multiple other locations using the same methods. They pushed past the bulletproof security tours, took control of the banks, and fired off illegally modified weapons made to enable automatic fire. On February 28th, at about 9.16 a.m., the two men entered and robbed the North Branch of Bank of America. They were quickly confronted by LAPD, which is when things dissolved into chaos. All of the footage was caught from above, as news teams followed the two gunmen out into the residential streets as they split up. Phillips continued on foot, while Emil took the getaway car. The two men, heavily armed and even more heavily armored, opened fire on the officers, continuing out into the adjacent street. Phillips in particular had an issue with his AK-47, but continued with a handgun, holding his ground until an officer got him in the torso. Phillips, uh, as he uh, has a malfunction with his AK-47, he drops it. He continues to walk down Archwood, takes out a Beretta 9mm uh, handgun, starts shooting at anything that moves, and he gets shot in the hand. He drops it, picks it up, puts the gun under his chin, and presses the trigger. As he goes down, an unknown uniform patrol officer fires and hits him in the upper torso, through the side, misses the vest, and severs his But the robber had taken the truck, and it took 28 shots to incapacitate Emil until he was no longer a threat. Then proceed to shoot under- It took 28 shots before you got his ass? 28 shots? God. Our car at him and we hit him 28 times until he stops being a threat and he stops shooting at us. The three of us take the suspect into custody and I take the ski mask off of Emil Monserrano. He looks up at me and his comment was, why don't you just put a round through my head? Nearly 2,000 rounds were estimated to have been fired off collectively between the robbers and responding officers. The thing is, this changed the landscape of police work across the country. 
This specific shootout, viewed by millions on the news, contributed to arming officers in Los Angeles and nationwide with semi-auto rifles, as the ineffectiveness of standard-issue small-caliber police pistols exposed a massive weakness in the country's police force. They made history in a way they couldn't have imagined, and probably in ways they hadn't meant to. Poker Tournament Heist on Tape Things can go from 0 to 100 very quickly, whether you realize it or not. When criminals see an end, they'll exploit it to their best ability, and this high-stakes heist was caught on camera in a place you probably wouldn't expect it. An annual poker tournament was being held in Berlin, and as players geared up to bluff their way into the champion spot, shouting erupts. Okay, well maybe next time. Uh, maybe. Are you going to play in uh, Snowfest? Uh, no, no. San Remo? But probably oh. in San Remo. Oh, there you go then. You can I take like, it down in I San like, Remo. I like the... the <laughs> All fucking hell breaks loose and they start fucking shooting. Holy shit. I couldn't imagine if I was watching this live. Like if I'm on TV, if I'm watching TV, just watch the poker, and then this all hell breaks loose, I'd be like, what the fuck's going on? What the hell? That'd be the way to get me on the end up, and then I'm like, I must know what happened. You can see one player look over his shoulder as the crowd runs, and quickly everyone follows. As the cable cuts off, that's where the feed ended, and the poker table was left empty. However, behind the scenes, the group was losing their cool, just barely skirting past security and showing signs of high stress and tension in their ranks. There was a brief scuffle between the team and security, but the guard valued his life higher than that of his job, and when the team came back to rescue the one captive member, he was released. They escaped with roughly $300,000 without a trace, and their identities hidden. Imagine watching your much-anticipated poker tournament only for things to turn into a high-stakes action shoot. It's something pulled out of an Oceans film, or something of the likes. But after a brief commercial break, everything was back to normal. Fatal Rio bus hostage situation unfolds on TV. Sporting events are full of high-stress situations, and people act wildly out of character when under stress. This took place just a month before the start of the 2014 World Cup in Rio, a bustling area of activity even without the impending sporting event. A dramatic four-hour standoff today in Rio de Janeiro, where an arm... Goddamn bus hijack. What the hell do you want the bus for? What the bus have that you want so badly? Armed man hijacked a bus, taking 37 people hostage. A man boarded a bus, attempting to rob everyone inside. Things quickly turned sour for the would-be robber as he was quickly intercepted by police. Traffic was shut down as the man held 37 people on board. Reports claimed the man made no real demands and simply kept people holed up in the bus without end. The footage doesn't show the inside of the bus, only the surrounding chaos as people attempted to figure out how to deal with this high-stakes situation. He was threatening to set the bus on fire with the nearly 40 people inside. Some hostages who were released said he poured petrol out and threatened to set the bus alight. Officers took the man out with a police sniper after unsuccessfully trying to reason with him. A hostage situation on board a bus in Brazil has ended. That must be terrifying because if you get it wrong, if you land wrong, if you get it wrong, your ass is fucked. Ended with the alleged assailant shot dead by a police sniper. Not a single hostage was harmed, thankfully, but those few hours of footage and news coverage had to be harrowing to watch live. News anchor mistakenly eats cat vomit on live TV. Has anyone ever told you don't eat things? Um, so bad I can, uh... Go one. Rare Boston Thunder Snow. Those of you who have the pleasure of living Thunder down south snow. on the eastern shore know. Like However, it's not all hurricane. Is. Sounds like they said thunderstruck on Thunder Snow! Dear Thunder Snow! Infamous for his meteorological reporting of massive storms, the story goes if you see Jim Cantor reporting from near you, you need to get out fast. However, it's not all hurricanes that Jim reports on. This snowstorm in Boston was incredible for different reasons, and incredible weather is what brings out Jim Cantor. Oh my goodness! He makes his way onto the screen and there's a flash of lightning. He's quickly floored by the sudden strike. Oh yes! 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 We got it, baby! We got it! We got it! Woo! It's rare because the temperature has to be a perfect mix to facilitate. 
His ass is jumping. Did you just see his celebration? He was so unhappy. So unhappy. Facilitate thunder. The whole moment is a flash, just like the lightning, but was forever immortalized on live TV. Ten, again, that's a twofer! That's a twofer, baby! Yes! <laughs> I love his celebration. I do not have a weatherman. Gets him a put fucking loses it. Starts celebrating so bad that he gets a good one. Newscaster nearly hit by lightning live. Oh, fuck. Even wilder than snow lightning is the chances of being hit or even nearly hit by lightning while you're at work. It's definitely more likely for a meteorologist to do that, but even then that's going to be slim to none. And where we are, this was not covered with water 30 seconds ago, now you got a whole inch of water, so that's how fast the standing water can happen. In between takes, this Arizona Fox affiliate caught a shot of an incredible moment. The newscaster quickly scurries off to safety, which is exactly the best course of action when a lightning strikes down less than a quarter of a mile away. TV reporter quits on air to advocate for medical marijuana. When you believe in something, you want to be able to say you stood up for what you believed in. I don't know if that's worth quitting for. Sometimes I don't think it's worth quitting for marijuana. Charlo Green of KTVA, an Alaskan CBS affiliate, put her money where her mouth was, live on TV. She reveals that she was the founder of the Alaskan Cannabis Club and has decided to quit her job as an anchor to dedicate her full attention to her efforts and belief that access to marijuana should be granted to state citizens. I, the actual owner of the Alaskan Cannabis Club, will be dedicating all of my energy toward fighting for freedom and fairness, which begins with legalizing marijuana here in Alaska. She does so, however, in an incredibly showy way. And as for this job, well, not that I have a choice, but fuck it, I quit. The other anchor is left speechless as her co-worker leaves her without words or a plan. We'll be, we'll be right back. A simple, F it, I quit, and- I'm gonna look at like, well! Fuck it, if there wasn't a reason to watch the news now, eh? <laughs> I remember my- yeah, at least there's a reason to watch the news now, you fucking just found one! We'll be right back after this message. And she walks off stage. Talk about sending a message. Ghost sightings on live news broadcast. Ghost encounters are seemingly more common than you'd expect. It's a blink and you'll miss it moment that's hard to call out. See behind me here, we have a few gravestones, but what you can't see because it's dark out. While the newscaster continues on about her story, describing the scene, behind her a ghostly figure crosses the screen. She doesn't react to it, but there's definitely something there. It's a graveyard. Would that really be the craziest place? BBC News gets hacked live on air. Being alive comes with a lot of opportunities for things to go wrong. This 2016 BBC News broadcast shows one possible scenario. The international news organization was hacked mid-broadcast by an unknown source. Unfortunately, for the last few minutes, we've had to... Unfortunately, for the last few minutes, we've had to... Problems. Coming up... They continuously cut out, emergency alarms go off, the display cuts, and then a man in sunglasses looks at the camera. The whole thing feels off-putting and a little scary before they finally regain control. The clip is short and sweet, but certainly not what you want to see when you're looking for news. Hello, I'm David Eads with BBC World News, our top stories. The Fatal Twilight Zone Accident, 1982. Studios go to great lengths to bring their vision to life on the screen, be it movies. We learned about this one via Nick Crowley. He was the one that revealed this part to us and what we were dealing with here. Movies or TV. Without barriers and safety nets, this whole process can potentially come, well, crashing down. The Twilight Zone accident is one such instance, where something meant to be incredible simply became a tragedy. A freak accident turns a war movie set into real life disaster, killing veteran actor Vic Morrow. It was July 23rd of 1982, and they were filming the Twilight Zone movie, an anthology film produced by John Landis and Steven Spielberg. In one of the stories, Vic Morrow, playing Bill Connor, was transported back in time to the Vietnam War, protecting two children from American troops as a Vietnamese man. 
The two children hired, Renee Shin Yi Chen and Micah Dean Lei, were two hired illegally without required permits. Everything was paid under the table to better circumvent state law that wouldn't allow the six and seven year olds to work at night. Unfortunately, Personally, they paid the consequences. The only ones that did really were the f children and the damn actor. Everyone else got their little fucking moment, but that damn children actor got their own life and they just killed this fucking shit. Actually, it was also never stated that the children would be working near explosives or an active helicopter. Fire safety officers, as well as firefighters on set and agents involved in the casting, were also not told about the children's presence on set. Everyone was, literally, in the dark. In California, they were filming a war movie today when suddenly, a helicopter carrying a camera crew crashed right in the middle of the action, killing actor Vic Morrow and two young children in the scene. The clip is just under a minute and involves the actor, Vic Morrow, who at the time was carrying both children. Numerous cameras caught multiple angles of the ultimate moment, where the helicopter goes down directly into the actors on set. The helicopter crashed just before 2.30 a.m., but obtaining close-up pictures of the scene has been difficult. The explosions were detonated at the wrong time. The director directed the pilot to get much lower suddenly rather than pulling out. This caused the helicopter to spin out of control when the rotor failed and detached from the tail. The low-flying helicopter spun out right into the man and two children who had previously fallen into the water due to the slippery nature of the scene. All three actors, Vic and the two children, were killed instantly by the crash. In truth, there was not one pinpointed mistake, but a long line of them. One that truly- Everything that happened involved in this was a mistake. Marks a dark scene in Hollywood history. And as you watch it over and over again, uh, you know, you become desensitized to it. Um, for good and for ill, I think. I mean, you, you tend to forget that they're really human beings there, so that's bad. On the other hand, to analyze it as a technical and why it happened, you have to be desensitized to it. And after a while, you looked at it as just a technical thing where we were looking at what caused the accident. Contestant on dating show A Serial Killer, 1970. Well, we know the dating game killer. We've heard this story so many times, it's insane. 79. Sometimes you get a peek behind the curtain. You get an idea of how people think and how they work. What better way to put yourself on full display than through a dating show? When people are trying to sell themselves, to find love, or meet the one, they get the very best version of themselves. And welcome to the dating game, and we'll get right underway. It's time to meet our first three eligible bachelors for game number one, and here they are! <laughs> The Dating Game is a panel-style show where three eligible bachelors are introduced to and asked a series of questions by a potential suitor. Here is a young lady with a wealth of experience. She once earned a living massaging feet. Only reason she's alive is because she turned down the date after the, the cameras went off air. But she quit when her boss suggested that she work her way up. Then she taught school in Phoenix, Arizona, and now she's here to educate our three bachelors in the art of amour. Welcome, if you will, sensational Cheryl Bradshaw. Hello, Cheryl. But this wasn't just any dating game. This was the one where Rodney James Alsala was a contestant. Well, let's see. Bachelor number one is a successful photographer who got his start when his father found him in the dark room at the age of 13, fully developed. <laughs> Between takes, he might find him skydiving or motorcycling. Please welcome Rodney Alcala. Rod, welcome. Simply introduced as a photographer, a skydiver, and a bachelor, it vastly undersells who the man in the clip truly was. What they didn't know at the time, and couldn't know yet, was that Rodney was more than just a photographer. He was a prolific serial killer, whose true numbers are still largely unknown. While he was only conclusively linked to eight murders, the numbers could have been as high as 130 different victims. At the height of his career, he came on the dating game simply looking for love, or so his responses might have you believe. He's been compared many times to Ted Bundy, and it's hard not to see why. He's a charmer on television, good-looking, and friendly. When Cheryl Bradshaw begins to question her bachelor from behind a wall, she starts with Rodney, who flirts up a storm, getting plenty of laughs and applause from the contestant and the audience alike. It's chilling to imagine that someone charming and charismatic like that could hide such a killer secret. All while well, no, it's the reason he's so charming like that is that he's able to get rid of the killer secret. While flaunting it all over television at the same time. Survivor contestant falls in fire. Survivor as a TV show has been known to go off the rails from time to time. 
personal injury, life-threatening events, and even off-site tragedies that need to be delivered. If you've ever seen the show, you've probably seen it all. They have staff on-site and backup plans to make sure to mitigate the risks and keep people safe, but what if things really go awry? When no one can see it coming? Michael Scubin ended his Survivor run in 11th place during Season 2 due to a sudden medical evacuation. He had taken to his tribe easily, becoming a de facto leader and provider, catching Peg and Fish to feed the group. His run had been extremely successful until one day it all came crashing down. While tending to the campfire, Scoopin accidentally inhaled enough of the fumes to pass out directly into the fire. The audience catches him in this moment as he lets out a feral scream, running into the water with burned hands. The water. You okay? Oh. oh my god! He's burnt. He's okay, burnt pretty bad, sir. Here's the water! Get away. Happened. This is when everyone begins to scramble, unsure of how to help or what they could even do. Do you want me to come in with you, Blake? Is that with you? Did you pass out? I, I was blowing on the fire and the smoke went right in my face, and I inhaled. And I passed out. Look at these things. The medical team then tends to Michael's numerous wounds, moving him gingerly into the tent. Everyone's noticeably terrified for him. Survivor at this point was so new that this had never actually happened. Which the floor. I love you guys! Oh my God, you right my drive. That would be fucking terrifying though. Like you're sitting there watching someone you know just falls into a fucking fire. Michael needed to be airlifted off premise due to the nature of his wounds, and the team rallied around him, offering support and well wishes. Scoobin was not able to finish his run on Survivors, his injuries were much too severe. And viewers nationwide were suddenly very aware that this was much more real than anyone expected. Here's Lisa, right here. I'm right here. I'm looking at some brave, beautiful people who I just have grown to love so much. It's all good, Mike. Don't even worry about it. Are you okay? Ladies and gentlemen, that is it for this reaction video. Let me know what you think in the comments. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Thank y'all for watching. I'll see y'all for the next one.